Hi, everyone. My name is Thane Rosenbaum, the creative director of the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society at Turo University, and welcome to the Folks Trials and Error series. Tonight, NCAA versus Alston, a case that went to the Supreme Court a number few years ago and deals with uh, collegiate athletics, uh, which has been in the news for a number of years, but in particular deals with providing additional educational benefits to athletes without uh, injuring or impairing their athletic status, their amateur status. Uh, in the last few years, we're starting to see collegiate athletes uh, uh, profiting from endorsement deals and licensing fees through name, images, and likeness. I think there's a lot of questions out there about, well, is that what NCAA versus Alston is about? And how did, did, how did that come about? And of course, there's the larger question, which is, should uh, college athletes be paid uh, for pay for play is the term of art, uh, given the billions of dollars that they of revenue that they generate for their universities, or uh, as the NCAA likes to say, uh, is it the fact that the college athletics are unique and that it's a special product because the students are in fact not professionals, but they're students. We're going to get to that uh, discussion in a moment. Uh, we have a perfect uh, guest, number of guests. We have Joe Nacera. Uh, you may remember him as a longtime uh, columnist for the New York Times. Hi, Joe. Uh, How are you? Joe, Joe is one of the first that actually in a more in the mainstream press started to call attention to this issue of the fundamental unfairness to college athletes to receive scholarships, but nothing other than scholarships. And so he made it one of his, I guess, causes. He was a business writer <clears throat> for a number of years and then became a business writer again. And he was on the sports page. And he's also authored a book, Indentured, the inside story of the rebellion against the NCAA. We have the attorney Jeffrey Kessler here as well. Jeffrey is the best known and most successful antitrust lawyer in the United States who specializes in sports law. There isn't really any case that he wasn't involved in, whether it's free agency in the NFL, whether it was equal pay for women who play on the national soccer, American soccer team, uh, ending the 2011 NFL lockout. He was involved in deflate gate. And yes, he was the attorney in NCAA uh, versus Alston that went to the Supreme Court. Jeffrey, thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here. And we have Ramogi Uma, uh, who in many ways is the face of the movement. He is the executive director of the National College, College Players Association. That is a, a, a union of sorts. Uh, and he is uh, an advocate who is largely responsible for calling attention to especially name, images, and likeness. Uh, you may have seen him on 60 Minutes, on cable net networks, uh, network news. Uh, he's been advocating on behalf of players uh, in a multiplicity of different ways, and we'll get to some of those important ways. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and in fact, he's testified, I believe, in both houses of Congress in front of a number of different committees. So thank you, uh, Ramogi. Appreciate you being with us tonight. Thanks for uh, having me. So um, let's start maybe with, uh, first of all, before we, before we talk to Jeff, we starting this about what actually happened in Alston. I think it's important to point something out that I talked about a lot. I'm also, ser I serve as the uh, legal analyst for CBS News Radio. So I cover the court and we're used to nowadays hearing the term of art five to four, which is that cases in the Supreme Court are narrowly decided and there's always the swing vote. And so we got used to this sort of conflicted Supreme Court that decides cases five to four as if the justices are never unanimous and they can't seemingly agree on anything. This case is nine to zero in favor of the athletes. And so I think it's a very important, it's, and I talked about this on CBS, and I think we should start off and talk about it here. This was itself unusual <laughs> that conservative justices, liberal justices, male justices, women justices, they all seem to agree there was a consensus here. And in fact, at least one of them wrote a, a, a concurring opinion that might tip the hands of where we're going. So Jeffrey, tell us a little about, briefly, about what the case actually says and what it doesn't say. Sure. So Alston is an antitrust case. Uh, the antitrust laws 
uh, in this country prohibits competitors from getting together and fixing the terms of competition. Essentially ganging, okay. ganging up on, employ, on, on a set of employees. That's right. And so what that means here is the schools compete with each other for the athletes. They then employ the athletes to generate hundreds of millions of dollars. And what the NCAA does is it gets all the schools to agree together, we're not going to pay for that labor. Uh, we're not going to give any compensation for that labor. And they have a 400-page rule book of complicated rules to prevent that compensation from being paid out. And by doing that, that violates the antitrust laws because it, what, it restrains trade? And what is the term of art here? Right. The, ter the term of art is that it unreasonably restrains trade. And Because, I'm sorry, just explain. Because left to their own devices, the players could negotiate a deal. Right. Be very clear. The case doesn't ask for the court to order the schools to pay the athletes. That's up to the schools. What the case sought was to stop the NCAA from restricting the schools from making their own choices about how to treat the athletes economically. So in this case, and maybe Joe, you could step in, what's the product? Is the product the, the players or is the product the games? Because so it's, 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 it's an interesting question because it seems like the product is that their their player the workers don't get paid is the product. Right. This is a restraint in a labor market. That's what the Supreme Court said. They said we focus on the labor market, and this is a group of schools who would employ those athletes, and they should not be able to have these restrictions, which stops each other from competing. For those athletes, but it seems like this. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. Yeah. So, so, so first of all, what the NCAA is is a, is a cartel. That's what it is. <laughs> and and the four hundred page rule book, that all that is is a way to to. Uh, it's just a a bunch of gobbledygook to prevent players from being paid. Okay, and what the NCAA has consistently said over the years, every time the players get a a one step closer to some kind of compensation, the NCAA says, well, this is going to destroy college sports because the, that's, that, the, 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 the fans want to know that the athletes aren't being played, that they're amateurs. By the way, that's just bullshit. The, 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 we've seen, so every, and then every time, you know, the, the players gain something, it turns out, oh my God, uh, college sports did not Collapse. But People why? still watch, go to the games. People still watch the games. The the game. What people care about. People don't. I in my view is. People don't want. The University of Michigan to outsource its logo to a semi professional team. They want some semblance that the players are affiliated with the university. Whether they get paid or not, they don't care. But remote, remote, let me, you've been at this for a long time. What I don't understand about this case, and Joe and Jeffrey jump in if you can, is that this case was really about educational benefits. This was not about compensation. It was not about revenue sharing. It wasn't about collective bargaining. It was simply, as I reported it when the case came down, it was about things like if a player also wanted to learn to play a musical instrument and take courses in jazz, that you could get the player a trumpet or that if well, the not, player wanted to go to medical school after he wanted to go to that school, he should be able to continue or she should be able to continue at school or get special tutoring or go to study or abroad. Why, why would the university care about that? Why wouldn't they say, yeah, spend as much time in the university as possible. We want you to claim that you're a student. So yes, we got you a computer. Yes, we bought you a trumpet. Yeah, isn't that proof that you're a student? Like, I don't understand why the university would argue this in front of the Supreme Court. Well, it's, I think it's important to note that's not how the case started. 
the ah. case started. So actually, I, I met Jeff uh, in person at an NFLPA uh, function and asked him to take up this case, you know, and then help put this case together. This case specifically was to blow open and to eliminate all compensation limits imposed by the NCAA. Um, clearly, I, and just to kind of put this, I know your audience, you said they're, they're kind of regular people. I think they can really understand. Most probably don't know what antitrust laws are. I didn't. Um, but to put this in perspective, if you're a grocery store worker, a lawyer, if you're a teacher, imagine if the whole nation of your employers came together and say, no, no one's going to pay anyone above minimum wage. In America, that's illegal. And it's kind of ridiculous to think about. But college athletes live in that ridiculous scenario. No one else in America has a national price fix on their compensation, especially while generating, you look around, they're generating billions of dollars a year. So, and, and also, I'm just saying, and also, it's not just the minimum wage. It's also that the, um, the thing that Joe was talking about, that the uh, condescending idea of amateurism, like you wouldn't say to lawyers, we're not going to pay you because we really like the idea that lawyers have uh, a pro bono instincts, you know, right. that what, we really what, think lawyers shouldn't get paid. Right. Because you wouldn't go to any professional and say to them, we want to preserve your status as a good guy. <laughs> yeah, so you, right. to, use, to use Joe's elegant legal term, it's <laughs> bullshit. And, and to give you an example of this, so at Alabama, the two strength and conditioning coaches made $550,000 a year each. The, the, the strength coaches, the president of the University of Alabama, made only five hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> so, so, so <laughs> that's how much money was being generated here and being kept from the athletes. So, and, let, and let me tell you. Let me tell you a quick story. Let me tell you a quick story. When I interviewed Jay Billis, the former um, Duke player who is now you know espn a, right espn guy yeah he was always a, he was always uh, uh when he was at duke he was an athlete who was very involved in ncaa affairs and they he was on a, a various committees and he was advocating for players you know for this that and the other thing health insurance and so on he told me you know back when i was a player i never thought about money for the players because my coach only made a hundred thousand uh. dollars. Now Mike Sushevsky makes ten million dollars. So the landscape has changed so profoundly that and 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 college sports has become so professionalized in every way except the way the players are treated. So, R Ramogi, I want you to finish what you were saying about uh, you went to Jeff to blow things up. But I also want you to pick up about something that essentially Joe is saying, because he's making the argument. And you probably hear this all the time from universities because you're, you're not their favorite guy. <laughs> they look at you and they go, do you understand, Ramogi, what these, con these uh, television contracts and these rights that we sell how it generates these incredible revenue so we can have we can field athletic teams in every sport that nobody would go to and do you understand ramogi how many scholarships this creates for other people and so yes we have to pay coaches a lot of money because we receive a lot of money but in the end those tens of millions of dollars are put to some use it's well, not I'll like i'll start there i'll start yeah. there because yeah. uh, since you're ending i'll start there um, and, and we simply point to Division II. Division II has about 100,000 athletes, scholarships everywhere, but they don't have any big revenue, right? There's no big football revenue. There's no big basketball revenue, but they have, they have full-time coaches. They have full schedules. This is a lie. Division I does not But wait, Division two. I'm sorry. Divi I, did, I don't even know. Division oh, two. So can they will actually field as many sports as a division one program. Like they'll yes, have, they have all, they have all the, that means the schools may have a few less sports, but they're nowhere in the same spending stratosphere. So division one, they try to justify monopolizing all this money, paying themselves lavish salaries by saying, Hey, if, the, if we have to pay the players, we have to cut all these sports. Well, that stands in contrast to division two, where they don't have big money. 
And just like any school-based sports, you're talking about taxpayer dollars, you're talking about fees from students and things like that, where they put on reasonable athletics. Division one, they're stuffing this money, they have so much money and they can't give it to players because, well, they don't want to give it to players. So they shove it to the coaches, facilities. So that's a myth. Those, those sports in division one were paid for decades ago, decades ago. So also, that's a lot. It's also that's racist. Lot. It's also racist. Yeah, and I want to talk, Ramogi's, I want to talk right, about me, because you have it, a complaint. Because, yeah. you, you, what you've got is two sports that are predominantly black, football and men's basketball, you know, basically playing for uh, uh, all these sports that are predominantly white, like, like tennis, uh, field hockey, golf, so on and so forth. So basically you're saying, we're going to take the disadvantaged black kids that we have lured to our school to play offensive tackle <laughs> so that, you know, some white kid from the suburbs can hit a hundred mile an hour serve in the fall. So Ramogi, what happened? Why is it that your aspiration when you first met Jeffrey Kessler, the great Jeffrey Kessler, and you thought we lined this superstar antitrust lawyer why is it that Austin only discusses educational benefits and doesn't actually blow up the whole system? Yeah, so let, let, me, let, me, let me answer that as to what happened, okay? So it's not unusual for judges to want to do things one step at a time. That's the history of legal cases in, the, in, this, in this country. So we asked for everything, as Ramogi said. We said, strike it all down. The judge who heard the trial said, well, I'm not ready to strike it all down because I'm not sure where the Supreme Court is, for example, because the NCA kept coming in and saying there was this old Supreme Court case uh, from 38 years ago that said arbitrism is great, so you better not go too far. So the judge said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to strike down all the restrictions on helping the education of the athletes. So scholarships, travel abroad, as you said, musical instruments, computers, even cash awards for making progress towards your degree or getting a good average. They, they, you could get five, six thousand dollars a year in those awards each year, but all that's for education. So the judge felt comfortable going that far. Now what, we now, now, what we now know is the Supreme Court nine nothing, right. not only said this is exactly right, but strongly indicated that they are ready to go further. So and we're and, and in fact, let me just finish this one thought. In fact, the old Supreme Court case that the judge had thought maybe this meant that amateurism was something special, the Supreme Court today said, no, <laughs> that's not what we meant in that case. No, that's not a get out of jail card, you know, for the NCAA. So, we're, what's going to happen, I believe now, and I'm already involved in a new case to do this, you're going to keep seeing the courts marching down this trail until we get to the point that Ramogi originally set us out to get. But it's going to get there. Ramogi, do you want to add anything to that? Because I have a, another question for you. Yeah, this is, this is actually kind of central here. So the other thing, the other reason why the judge narrowed it to educational related expenses only is because of previous antitrust lawsuit, the O'Bannon versus NCA case, the Ninth Circuit set a terrible and flawed precedent and said, well, um, the judge ruled, you know what, this was an antitrust violation. This was, this was over name, image, and likeness. Ed O'Bannon, former basketball player, was in a video game with the A Sports and the NCA. NCA compensation limits prevented Ed from getting paid. So they said, yeah, it's a restraint of trade. It's a violation. And the, and the, and the district court said, well, we're going to make sure you can at least give scholarships equal to cost of attendance, and we'll let schools pay $5,000 in an NIL trust fund if they wants to. The Ninth Circuit removed that because it said that would destroy amateurism. If you had NIL money that could eventually be unlimited, untethered to education, that's where this phrase came from, untethered to education, 
that would destroy an amateurism and college sports as we know it. Now, since then, and since the Austin case, my organization had sponsored the first California NIL bill, where we had a state basically strike down the NCAA's prohibition on NIL pay. Every state in the nation right now, every state in the nation has athletes who, who have the ability to earn. I thought it was, I thought, it, I'm sorry, Ramogi, I thought it was only 29. You're saying the whole country now has yeah, it? The whole, all the athletes have the freedoms. Only about 20, over two dozen states have actual laws, but I every see. athlete has the freedom in every single state. So by the Ninth Circuit's definition of amateurism, amateurism is dead because now you have every athlete in the nation with the ability to, to earn unlimited NIL un money unrelated to education. So which means the reason why the judge, part of the reason why she narrowed it in Austin was from a flawed precedent in the Ninth Circuit, which is now obsolete. Amateurism is dead. All that falls apart. So, yes, so and the NCAA saw this writing on the wall. What happened is that right after the Austin decision came down, the NCAA met and it also looked at all the state laws that Mogi had helped get into place. And it said, we cannot continue these NIL restrictions you know, anywhere. Because why? Because it's pretty clear the Supreme Court's going to find it to be an antitrust violation. So even where the states don't require it, we're going to end up being liable for triple damages if we do this. So to be careful, they got rid of most but not all the NIL was. But did they but think they got rid of most of them? So that's an important distinction that the NA, it just so happens that one should not think that the Supreme Court in Alston was discussing or granting rights to NIL. It just so happens that in the aftermath of that decision at nine to nothing, what Jeffrey and Ramogi are saying, there this was like a preemptive strike by the universities to say, let's make this available. Let's not have no what, objection what, what, the to way I would The way I would put it, the reasoning of Alston meant that the NIL restrictions were illegal. So even though it wasn't discussed, the right. reasoning of Alston struck it down. And, and that's, why, that's more, why the NCAA wouldn't fight it. That's why that's the NCAA correct. couldn't fight it. Because they understood where this was going, but they didn't also think well, maybe what we should do is what we really don't want to do, right? We don't want to share revenue on these TV deals, and we don't want to pay students a, a wage to treat them as employees. So why don't we just cave on everything else? Let's get them computers. Let's send them to medical school. Let's get them musical instruments. And if they want to cut deals with the local car wash, fine. You know, if they want to cut a deal, we're not paying them. They're cutting. I mean, this is an important. I think it's really important. This is important to note. The NSA did not say that. They were really? forced to. Jeff Kessler in the Austin case forced them. The state of California knocked down their NIL rules in California. It was forced. The NSA does nothing voluntarily. And <laughs> they put the compromise themselves. And honestly, because they've done that, now their authority has really been uh, diminished. But right. well, the NCAA does not give anything. And, they, they now, they're take it from them. and now they're stuck. Because the, the new case we have, which is called House yeah. versus NCAA, is doing several things. First, it's going back. By the way, the audience should know House is your case. Yes. Okay. House is another case we now brought, <laughs> right. just, along with my co counsel, Steve Berman, who's my co counsel in Austin as well. This is a class action again. And this time, we're seeking first triple damages back to 2016 for all the NIL restraints. So that's number one. Number two, we're seeking an injunction against them having future NIL restraints because as Ramogi said, they don't want to give up anything. They claim they only have temporarily gotten rid of their NIL rules so it could come back tomorrow we want to make sure they never can come back. And then third, to get to your revenue sharing point, we are directly going after the remaining restriction that they can't pay the athletes for their NLL, NIL rights in broadcasts. And we are seeking both damages back to 2016 
because the athletes couldn't get that NLI broadcast payments. And we're seeking to stop the rules going forward so that in the future, the athletes can get so, so can share of TV revenues from Jeff them. or Joe or Romogi explain to me for, for one thing, how is that get, who's get, who's making those payment? An NIL payment for an athlete who plays three hours on Saturday night foot on a game on prime time. What, what is that? That is a, that is a piece of the revenue that would have gone to the university or yes. is it a separate no. negotiation? No, not, that's, no, not no. What, that's not what happened. That's not what's happening right now. That may be what's happening in the future. But right now, basically companies, a lot of companies are doing this. Co companies are basically approaching athletes and saying, I'd like you to endorse this product or I'd like you to be our spokesperson or I'd like you to do a YouTube video and we will pay you uh, X amount of dollars, um, uh, and, and it's your money to keep. It has nothing to do with the university whatsoever. Except but, but wait a minute, but Jeff, I don't but, understand no, how the, the broadcast yeah, right. Broadcast is, is different. Yes, yeah, so that's what I'm trying to understand. Right, they haven't gotten to that yet. Yeah, that's yeah. what Jeff's case is going to do. Yeah, that's what I want to understand. Like, what, yeah. who, what money is that? Where is that? Oh, yeah, so I can explain that, okay? Right now, if you're CBS, if you're yeah. Fox, if you're Amazon, whoever's doing a deal yeah. with, you know, with the NCAA or the conferences, frequently it's the conferences. Uh, the NCAA does the, the, the March Madness, but everything else is done through the conferences I for, their, for their broadcast mostly. The conferences now have to deliver to the broadcast guarantees that, hey, we're giving you NIL rights of the athletes. Right. They, they, they so already, you're saying you I'm sorry, this is very important, right? You're saying that the university or the NCAA has already sold the rights to the quarterback, right? That right is being everybody. Everybody's they, been sold. They're giving all the rights, and yet their rules say they will pay nothing for the value of those rights. So that is what our case is going after, saying you've got to one, give damages for the past because you took these rights and you sold them and you got all this money and the athletes didn't get their value. And number two, in the future, you got to break this down. So what will happen in the future is the conferences will negotiate with the athletes to pay for the value of their NIL rights just because they will be no longer stopped right. from doing so by the NCA rules. So what is, so there's no, at this point, federal regulation of any of this, right? So I've, I've, I look something up. What is this Collegiate Athlete Compensation Act? What is that? How does that play itself out here? I think right now, I'm not even sure which one that is. There's so many bills that have been introduced in Congress. So Congress uh, has been trying to create some kind of federal legislation. That well, you, have, would... you have some in Congress that want to create revenue sharing, Cory Booker, uh, Richard Blumenthal, are two senators that introduced the College Athletes Bill of Rights in 2020 that had revenue share, fair revenue share. But and aren't there some of this has to do with how to treat former players, like medical expenses? That's not, that's that particular part of bill, that particular bill had, it was comprehensive, had the enforcement of health and safety standards, which does not exist in NCAA sports right now. There are no concussion protocols that are enforced. Um, sexual assault, it's not against NCAA rules, Okay. Um, medical expenses for not just current players, but for former players that was covered and various protections, but also had revenue share in there. Now, not, not much passes in Congress these days, and, and this is no different. And I think you have different splits on what should happen. There are some lawmakers that are trying to introduce bills that would, as a federal law, ban college athlete compensation. So, you know, it's all over the place in Congress. I see. So, Joe, let me ask you something, since you covered this early and did it as, as a, you know, I wouldn't say crusade, but it was something you were associated with. Are you surprised at where we are now? Did you assume this was happening? Does it seem particularly the way that Jeffrey describes it, like really having the NCAA on the run, that this is, you know, that, that Alston is so significant because it was nine to zero and because of Justice Kavanaugh's concurrence, in which he seemed to really take distaste at the argument that the NCAA had a right not to pay these players. I think uh, Kavanaugh at some point says, 
what they're doing would be illegal in every other industry in, the, in, in America, except for that. Are you surprised at the pace of this? And do you think it's falling in the direction that, because well, I'm just surprised to hear that Ramogi said that there are some senators that would like to pass legislation to prevent pay for play. Yeah, they're all in Alabama and Mississippi. Um, the, the, am I surprised? First of all, it was a crusade. I'm not, I'm not ashamed of that. I was a columnist. It was a, it was a crusade. You, you, you stumble across the NCAA as I did in 2010 and you don't know anything about it. And you always think the NCAA is the good guys and you think the people they're punishing are the bad guys and you look into it and you're absolutely horrified. You cannot believe what's, what, how these guys operate. It, it just, you just can't believe it. So, you know, I started writing column after column after column. And, and, when, and you know, when I was at the Times, in the early days, I would get emails once in a while from people who would say, you know, if I wanted to read about sports, I would read, go to the sports page. You're an op-ed columnist and, and, and write about something that I care about. Don't write about sports. And I would, I would respond and I would say, this is not about sports. This is about human rights and it's about civil rights. And I also felt very strongly that, you know, you're someone like me, there's not a whole lot of things in the world that you can bring about change, but this was one of them. This was one of them. And I, I am surprised that it happened. As, I'm not surprised that it's happened. I'm only surprised that it's happened this quickly. I was very discouraged after the O'Bannon case because I felt that they had taken this, they had gone so far and they had taken it, you know, to the, to, to the, to the district court. And then the, the, the ninth circuit had knocked down the, the extra $5,000. And you just thought to yourself, oh my God, even after all this time, they're still buying into the same old crap. They're still, right. you know, they're still buying into the amateurism thing. But that's, so, that clearly after fell O'Bannon, in. After O'Bannon, I was very discouraged. I thought it's not going to happen. And then, you know, along comes Alston and along comes California with NIL and Ramogi all over the country. And all of a sudden, you know, what, you know, what really happened is the, 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 the American public, which had always assumed that the NCAA was on the right side of things, the American public changed its mind. Hmm. I, I really think that. And and if you if you still had eighty percent of the public against playing players and and pro NCAA, I don't think we'd be here today. I, I really don't. Huh. Hey, Ramogi, I want to know. Um, I understand that your association uh, filed a discrimination complaint with the Department of Education. So I'm looking. I'm wondering, and it it seems to. Um, uh, pick up on something that uh, Joe said earlier when he jumped in and said, you know, by the way, it's racist, right? It seems to me that you're making a similar argument here that the uh, there's a Title VII violation because of a disparate impact, and the impact is disparate in particular with respect to African-American players. Can you explain that? And that's obviously something that's being done by your association, that's not a Jeffrey Kessler project. These are separate tracks, right? These are things that are ultimately trying to achieve similar results. And I'm actually, maybe after this, I, I'm curious, maybe Jeffrey can explain, does that do things like complaints before the Department of Education, do they end up helping turbocharging house? Do they actually help those cases to have something like that on the side? Anyway, Ramogi, explain this. Sure. And actually, before I do, I think in Austin, Brett Kavanaugh, in his concurring statement, said the same thing. He said, you know, you have a situation where the NCAA, their executives, the commissioners, the coaches are all getting well paid, while the players who are mostly Black get nothing. I mean, this is just a fact. And Austin was not about the racial implications, but he proactively brought that up. Um, there's just facts. There's numbers. And, and in civil rights law, there's two ways to violate the civil rights law. One is to purposefully exclude black people. Like, let's just say if, if the NCAA said, well, we can pay the white players, but not the black players, obviously right. it's a civil rights violation. But if they say, hey, we're not going to pay, we'll pay everybody else on campus and we won't have any restrictions on any other student. But for college athletes, we will. And when those athletes in the revenue sports are disproportionately black, 
you have an, uh, an issue. So if a, a, a group of people who are protected by civil rights law by race or other areas, if they have a disproportionate impact that's negative on a, on a rule or a policy that's on the surface neutral, that's called desperate impact. Maybe you didn't try to target them, but this rule has a disproportionate impact on a protected class. So um, that is something that's a whole nother issue, civil rights. Uh, we filed that complaint with the Department of Education. Um, they referred it to the EEOC, which is basically an employment discrimination uh, entity for the, from the federal government. So now we're in contact with them. But um, I, thought, I thought the problem there, I'm sorry, I thought the problem there is that the EEOC keeps saying, yeah, but we only deal when we're dealing with employees and college athletes are not employees, they're student they, athletes. They have not said, we, we're just engaging them. And so basically we have to do two things. One, we have to prove college athletes are employees, which we're in the process, we're prepared to do. We've, By the um, way, I understand there are two states that have already said that they are. I think New York is one of them. Am I right? Uh, New York and Iowa have already said, um, do I have this right? I was surprised to hear I this. I don't think so. There's two, okay. there's two states that banned it. <laughs> Uh, I think Ohio and uh, Michigan passed laws preventing college. So no, there's no, <laughs> there's no decision yet on the concept of being employees. The only decision. Oh, what, what, go ahead. I, I was going to say the only decision that, that's on the books in a different organization. I helped spearhead the unionization of Northwestern football players. Um, there was a decision, the district or the, um, the NRB in the area ruled that yes, they're employees. It got appealed to the full board. They didn't rule against us. They just said they're not going to assert jurisdiction, which effectively kind of um, kicked the ball down the line. Uh, but at this point, there is not a clear cut answer um, in any well, state. What, well, what there is, is the general counsel of the NORB who issues advice, has issued advice saying that she believes they should be considered employees for purposes of the Labor Relations Act. National Labor Relations Act. It's a little complicated because they, you, you, have, you, you could be an employee for different reasons, right? So, so if you're an employee under the Labor Relations Act, it means you have the right to unionize and to organize. If you're an employee under the Civil Rights Act, Title VII, then you have a, a protection against discrimination. If you're an employee under the Fair Labor Standards Act, you get a minimum wage. You know, under either federal law or there are state minimum wage laws as well. So there are lots of definition of employees. In my view, the athlete should mean all of them, but you sort of have to fight that out case by case in order in order to get that achieved. Something Romogi said before that I don't think most people picked up on, but I it struck me. He's right when he says that. There are students that are working on campus. I guess they work in the library, right? So they are actually getting paid. They're actually receiving, sometimes I guess it's work study, but some of them are receiving a check, right? That is a payment to work at the university. And I think that right. that does undermine the NCAAA's argument because it's not like they don't employ students. They do, right? As waiters. And, and, and sometimes it's quite a lot. Uh, I believe that the editor-in-chief of the Stanford newspaper, uh, student newspaper, gets paid something like $50,000 a year because they recognize it as a real job uh, that he's doing. And even though someone might call that an extracurricular activity, says he gets paid by the university for that. And obviously he's an employee, right? And so, um, uh, the a lot of the, the only reason the NCA came up with the idea of not calling the athletes employees was to try to avoid all of these legal protections, right? That, that otherwise they would have always called them employees. So, but who who is really the employer? Is it the league, NCAA, or at the universities? And does it make a difference it be, it be, if it's a state if it's a state college versus a private college? In other words. Should Harvard or uh, Stanford, by the way, a very, very wealthy school and a big, big time college program, are they legally in a different position than University of California in Berkeley? So not for some of the things we're talking about here. No matter what school you're at, it's the school is generally the athlete's employer, if you will. Although under 
labor law, there are concepts of joint employers. And so the NCAA or the conferences might also be joint employers as well. But you basically, they're employed with the school because that's who they're playing for in the team. The state issue is a little different, which is under the current law, states can opt out of having unions. You may know that some states, you know, don't allow, in effect, unions for state employees. And uh, they call them right to work laws. And so some of the big states wouldn't allow, for example, you know, Ohio State players to get paid that way or be unionized. And that's something that Congress has to overcome. And some of the bills you're talking about in Congress would do that. It would say, forget state law, federal law is supreme. They can unionize, but none of those bills have passed. The bills in one way haven't passed. The bills the other way haven't passed. They're all over the place. Uh, but so right now, that's the current state is states can block that. Does um, uh, Ramogi, you had something? Yeah, so my organization also, um, after Jennifer Abruzzo, the, the NLRB general counsel, uh, issued that memo declaring college athletes are employees, in her opinion, uh, we teed up a case. Uh, so we filed unfair labor practices against USC, UCLA, the Pac-12, and the NCAA, all as joint employers. And so we want to give the board an opportunity to make a decision. From our uh, perspective, it is clear that college athletes are employees. And that's another way to also break compensation. Again, when you're employees, now you got minimum wage, you have overtime. You have the Pac-12 surveys of the average athlete. They they say they spend over 50 hours a week in their sport alone. So you talk about, you know, breaking through a, a compensation limit. It will be impossible to hold a limit when there are overtime laws in the state of California, when there are overtime laws, you know, across the nation. They, they're they will no longer be able to hold a nationwide price fix if college athletes are employees. I, I read something also. You won't, have a, you won't have a limit. Yeah. You won't have a limit. Uh, Jay Billis, once again, has, the, has totally the right idea here. He says, he says, he says, people say, well, how are you going to play the players? And Jay says, well, you ever hear this thing called a contract? <laughs> so, so the mother and the kid come in to the coach. And the coach says, I'll pay you $50,000 a year to be my halfback, but you got to stay three years. You can't be a one and done. And the mom says, that's great, but he has to be able to major in sociology. Yeah, but that's the interesting thing. I did some reading about this, which is very distressing. You know, for all the talk about student athlete, apparently some, some students graduated athletes and said, I had thought that I would go to medical school. But my practices were every morning and I wasn't able to take lab classes in organic yeah. chemistry. And so therefore, the whole point of me getting a scholarship has been undermined because right. I couldn't even take the classes I wanted. And I ended up majoring in political science. So, yes, I didn't pay, but I didn't end up with the degree I wanted because I was always at practice. Right. And this is a fix. This is actually a fixable problem. First of all, so much of the education that, that the players get is a scam. Because all they really, they, they basically are majoring in eligibility. <laughs> they, they, they just want to keep the players on, on the field. Also, no, the players who are, play, who are working 50 hours a week in their sport, the idea that they should be taking five courses a semester is insane. It's absolutely insane. They should have a system where the players take one or two courses a semester. And then when, after their four years are up, they get a free education at the school until they until they're able to graduate. And even if they go pro, even if they're pro, they could come back to the school. This is a totally fixable problem. It's wrong. So one of the smartest players in the NBA is retired now, Shane Battier. He told me once that he 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 majored in, in religion. And, and why did he major in religion? Because it was the only serious major he could take that didn't interfere with basketball. Wow, wow. Um, you know, for, for those of us, myself included, who never really understood how, because, you know, I, you, some of us here are of an age, Ramogi is not, remembers when, you know, in the Olympics, American basketball started to lose to the Soviet Union because we were sending young kids and then there was the dream team. So I, I never really did understand, I never, did, thought about it like how did that happen because wasn't that about amateur status 
as well. How did we send Michael Jordan and Larry Bird and Magic Johnson when in fact the whole point was that Olympics was about promoting amateur? Well, because, because the Olympics was never about that. You know, the Olympics is about money, just like all sports. And so when they concluded that they were going to get better television ratings and, you know, more money, by allowing the pros to compete, guess what? The pros can compete. And understand, to go back to the, to the racial idea, the whole concept of amateurism, which was in the beginning of the Olympics, was itself a concept that came up by really elite uh, white aristocrats yes. who didn't have to work in Europe and could in effect, you know, engage in sport for the fun of it because they had estates and fortunes. And so they imposed that concept, you know, on the Olympic movement to begin with, and by the way, used it to both keep out the elite and also keep out people of color, right? Which is why it was so game-changing, you know, you know, when athletes of color started competing in the Olympics and gradually these restrictions against any type of compensation all fell apart, except historically people like poor Jim Thorpe, right? Mm -hmm. Who was, you know, who was, you know, basically driven to death. Stripped of his medals because he played uh, semi-pro baseball. And, and, and tortured his whole life because he needed money and spent the summer playing, you know, a short period of time in semi-pro baseball, right? right. You know, it's, so it was just absurd. But anyway, that's that, what happened in 1992. So, they allowed it. So, so what we don't have, sometimes we usually do, this time we had a, 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 we went in a slightly different direction, but normally we would have had someone from the NCAA, a lawyer or someone ah. who, who was more, what, what are they going to, I'm just curious, what do you think their best argument is if House goes to the Supreme Court? Are they going to say, look, we still maintain we have a unique product, and despite what Joe Nacerath said, he's just wrong. The people really like knowing that the kids are students and that they're not getting paid and that that's the product and we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't pay them. Uh, uh, and 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 same. the Supreme Court has already said, let me just say this one thing. And the Supreme Court already said that we have to provide everything that is educational, unlimited. So we, it's not like we've now like we've now compromised. We are going to give computers and we're going to give. And so now you want us to write a check too? Same. Yeah. Same. Here's what's going to happen. The NCAA is going to wind up being a body that runs championships. That's the only thing they're going to do five years from now, six years from now. What does that mean? No, they're going to have, they're going to run the, they're going to run the basketball championship. They're going to run the baseball championship in Omaha. They're going to run, that's what they're going to do. They are going to run all the championships, wrestling, field hockey, whatever, but that's going to be their only role. What's going to happen is why you what? So what happens to the so wait, 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 let book? me finish. Let me no, finish. No, I just want to understand what the you're saying. What's going to happen is that the conferences are going to become the powerful, uh, uh, the rule making bodies, both in terms of, uh, you know, what, 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 what counts. They will wind up paying play. They will wind up setting rules that pay players. They will wind up setting rules about what's legal and what's illegal. They will wind up setting rules about just about everything except, you know, rules on the field and uh, and, and running championships. And what's going to happen have, to the 400 page book? It'll be thrown out. Yeah, it's, it's going to be, be it's, 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 it's going to get thrown out. And Joe is right. And, and the reason that will lead to compensation for the athletes. Yes. It's because the conferences compete against each other for the athletes. Exactly. As long as the antitrust laws stop them from not competing with each other, then the SEC is going to provide all that compensation and benefits to get the athletes. And the it's, Big Ten it's worth, is Jeff, it's worth pointing out they're already doing that with NIL. They're already doing that with NIL. 
Correct. Schools are setting up NIL sort of committees that help the players get money. Well, that's right. what I was just going to ask for Mogi. Does he have a problem with these, what are they called, booster funds? The collectives and boosters. Collectives funds. Can you explain what that is? And yeah, so from your perspective, do you think that the universities, you know, have a point? Like, for instance, wasn't there a spat between the Alabama coach and the Texas A&M coach about this very point last summer? So as we were working to pass laws in every state, eventually it came up. Should we ban the boosters from uh, participating and paying players NIL money because they're going to have different motives and there might be a lot of money? And we, and we fought very hard to make sure that the boosters can provide that NIL funding, whether in, you know, a collective, some of them have created whole companies to do this. And the reason we say that is because they're already boosting. They're already trying to create unfair advantages for their schools. They've done that forever. And the schools that benefit and coaches, I mean, look at their payouts. Good Lord, you have boosters come together, pay a coach $20 million just to leave when he's bad, all right? So why draw the line in the sand when it comes to players being able to benefit when nothing else, when competitive equity do, do, really does not exist? The schools with the best recruits and biggest recruiting budgets and the most money will get the best players and get the best TV deal, deals and the cycle continues. So it should not be on college athletes to bear the burden to pretend that competitive equity exists. So we fought very hard to make sure that that is okay. Um, we've seen coaches leave in the middle of the season to another school when they got another offer. So why have a double standard where coaches can leave at the drop of a dime um, over money, but players um, on some level, if they're enticed, now we're fine if, if there's a rule saying that you can't induce a, a player to come to a particular school, we're not against that. But that school having a, a well-oiled machine as a collective in front of everybody and the and recruits putting two and two together, that's fine. That's America, just like they do with the best coaches, the biggest facilities and all the top schools. So uh, we fought hard for that. So the, the ship has, the, go ahead, Jeff. The spat you're talking about. Yes, right. By Alabama, which was Nick Saban, the head right. football coach, was the most ridiculous, embarrassing statement that Saban has ever made. And that's, by the way, saying a lot because he's a long <laughs> history. And <laughs> what he said, just listen, Alabama, who has been by far the dominant football program in this country, over the last 10 years, by far dominates everyone. He was complaining that another school might take an athlete away from Alabama because they would have collectives supporting them with NIL rights. <laughs> and he said that will hurt competitive balance. What is he talking about? <laughs> Every player who leaves Alabama for another school is helping competitive balance. It's not hurting competitive balance. <laughs> I mean, I, I think after he got the words out of his mouth, he realized how stupid it sounded. And then he tried to retreat. So the, the, sh the ship has already sailed on the argument, if there is an argument, I don't hear it, but if the argument says, Look, look throughout Western Europe. Uh, you don't see universities compete with each other athletically this way. There are these semi-pro leagues. In fact, even the NBA now has, is that a G League or a D League? I don't know what that's called, where you're not an NBA player, but you sort of are. You're wearing a uniform and it looks, and then of course, we know players go off and play in Europe. You know, the, the European model is very different where you, you know, you you basically groom kids through through their childhood, but Dane, they don't Dane, they you, don't end up Dane, playing you're, in you're college. You're on the wrong track here, Dane. You're okay. on the wrong track here. Let's you're find out what track we should be on. Look, America has had college sports for a hundred plus years. It, it's ingrained. It's part of our system. It's part of our DNA. It's part of who we are. It's not going away. People love it. We're never going to go to a, a European type thing, type system, and as much as you know, as problematic as it is, that the athletic department way too often is the dog wagging the university tail. It's what we got. It's what we got. So you have to just forget about Europe and just sort of say, well, how do we make this system? the best and the fairest possible system that we can make it. Yeah, and what, do, and what does define college sports and is different from Europe 
is that the athletes are in fact students at the school. Nobody right. challenges that. There's, there's no reason they can't be compensated students, just like the right. one who I mentioned at Stanford who gets paid yeah. money to yeah. be in the newspaper, but they are students. That is what distinguishes college sports. It's what people like, they get an affinity with their schools, but there's not any justification for preventing the schools from compensating those students. It's an entirely different issue, and it's one which the NCAA has historically confused together. Does anyone know, I guess all three of you probably know, how did this start? Like at what point, we had college athletics, but when did big money, because I'm surprised to hear the Jay Bellis story, Joe, that he seems to me like a relatively young man in my mind. His at when he was playing, Coach K only got a hundred thousand dollars. Like that seems like yeah, well, no, the professionalization of college sports really began with the founding of ESPN, uh, which I believe was 1979, and also with the uh, with a guy named Miles Brand became the he was the former president of of, of Indiana University. He's the guy who fired Bobby Knight, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but he became the president of the NCAA. And he's the first person who really sort of said, uh, not in so many words, let's professionalize, let's maximize income, revenue, uh, but do so in a way that doesn't pay the players. And they called that the, he named this the collegiate model. And that's really where it began. That's when they be really, really pushed to get sponsorships and advertising and, and, you know, all that stuff where you can't walk into the NCAA Final Four game with a Pepsi because Coke is the sponsor, blah, 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 blah. A lot so of remember, and remember, during, that, during that time, uh, if right around Miles Brand's era, that was also when the DVR was invented. So yes. now, how do you how do advertisers get people's eyeballs on commercials when they can just skip past them? Well, they realized very soon that the only way to do that was in sports because no one wanted to watch the sports game later. Everybody, even to this day, primarily watches sports live. So then the advertisers now pay a whole lot more to advertise in front of sports, and that, and that hikes up uh, TV values and you know all the other commercialization. Yeah, and, and people forget says even in the NFL in Major League Baseball, the NBA, there was not this type of money in the 1950s and in the 60s and even into the early 70s. <clears throat> it really was the, the 80s forward that sort of right. transformed absolutely, the absolutely revenue right. in sports in terms of that. You know, when, when Don Drysdale and Sandy Koufax held out together in the 60s, but arguably the two best certain combination of pitchers at that time, they were holding out to be the first players to make more than $100,000 a year in baseball. That's right. Right? So That's it is right. not that long ago. No. And, and actually, you know, the funny part is yeah. a lot of this is based in an antitrust lawsuit prior, the 1984 um, Board of Regents case where um, before the NCAA had a monopoly on the TV, uh, TV contracts for football, and they'd only, they only they severely limited it. And they said, well, we don't want to have a lot of games on because if we have a lot of games on, uh, nobody will show up in person. So they limited it. And then the schools wanted to strike their own deals and they sued the NCAA, they got into it. The schools won. And from there, that's when you, now you can turn on, you know, Saturday, you can see a ton of games because the NCAA lost an antitrust lawsuit where they had previously monopolized all the games. So now there's a lot more opportunities to bring money into the sport as well. Right. But again, as they professionalized, they didn't allow the players to, to participate in that. It's, so worth last... noting, it's worth noting that the NCAA does not control college football at all. And that's because they lost the Regents case in 1984 and the universities basically took it over and the conference has basically ruled. Is that why you said before, when you said soon they'll just manage the games, but they'll have no role and the conferences will take over. Is that the reason? No, no, no. I really say that because I think um, I think these court cases keep diminishing its power. And mm -hmm. I think it keeps making these stupid arguments that everybody knows is wrong. And ultimately, the conferences are just going to say, we don't need you. Right. We don't need you. You know, right. you know, run the championships and set up the rules of conduct on the field and we'll take care of everything else 
Huh. And, and, you know, if you have the SEC, I mean, I think we're going to wind up with two conferences. Yeah. The SEC and the Big Ten. They're each, going to have 30, they're each going to have 32 teams, plus somebody's going to have Notre Dame. You know, that, that's going to be how it works. And they're going to compete with each other. And, and part of that competition is going to be about money. Hmm. So the last thought I'll just leave, I know, in the end, is that everyone should keep in mind that collectively, NCAA football, FBS football, and Division I basketball makes more revenue each year than the NBA, than Major League Baseball, than the National Hockey League, than Major League Soccer. The only sport it is trailing and gaining on right. is the National Football League. Right. And in almost every state in this country, not everyone, but in the majority of states in this country, the highest paid state employee is the football coach <laughs> on one of the state university in those schools. <laughs> and that's what the NCAA has said is an amateur business. Except, that is a great- Jeff, Jeff, except in the states where the basketball coach is the number one. Right, right. Player. No, that yeah, is a- that, 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 There's some of that too. Yeah, that is a great final words. Gentlemen, you know, the trials and error series we've had for a number of years, just in case, just for the record books, we had the O.J. Simpson case, we had the lawyers, we had the Goldman family, we had the Casey Anthony case, we had the Bernard Getz case, which may happen again, given the violence in New York City subways. We had Larry Flint uh, was a guest. We had for the case that went to the Supreme Court on the First Amendment parody case. We've done Muhammad Ali. We did the case on the uh, draft evasion case. We had Supreme Court law clerks who clerked on that court. We had uh, Ali's lawyer. Uh, and we even had the NFL concussion case in which enough, um, the lawyers were involved and so was Harry Carson. This was really great. <laughs> I just want to say you really added to this great series and I'm grateful to all three of you. So thank you so much. Uh, before we, I think we have one last announcement and we'll say goodnight to our friends. Uh, we have, what is it, next week, right? We have uh, our headliner series and we have Roya uh, Hakakian. Uh, who will be talking about the revolution in Iran, which we're calling, and she's calling it an article that she wrote for Atlantic, the hijab revolt in Iran. And so that'll be part of our uh, headliner series. That's next week. So you'll join us. Gentlemen, it was really great. It was wonderful. Thank you, all three of you. And um, I'm Thane Rosenbaum for Folks. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.